Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. So it's good to be back with all of you. And today I'll speak on the topic of uh, an age old topic which we'll analyze in terms of Lord Vama's appearance. That is, why do bad things happen to good people? See, this is a question which everybody gets sometime or the other. Recently, I was at a place and one six-year-old boy came and he asked me, why do bad things happen to good people? So when somebody asks this question, before you can answer the question, you have to question the question. So what happened? Because otherwise, where people are coming from, you don't know. So he says, you know, today morning I was taking, my, uh, taking a biscuit with my milk and my biscuit fell into the milk. <laughs> that was the bad thing. <laughs> so, what is the bad thing can also vary. And for, for that child, oh, I lost my biscuit. <laughs> That's a big bad thing for him. So, everybody has this question. Now, the Bhagavatam answers this question in a very, you could say, unusual, at the same time practical way. The answer is, why do bad things happen to good people? This question really has no answer ultimately. We can talk about karma as an answer, it's our own past karma, but you know we have not seen what we have done in the past and we don't know that. So it seems very unfair. So trying to philosophically answer this question, it first of all, it is not always a satisfactory answer. And it doesn't serve the emotional need at all because somebody is feeling unfairly singled out. So the Bhagavatam adopts an entirely different approach. It is not why do bad things happen to good people, but what do good people do when bad things happen to them? What do good people do when bad things happen to them? And if you see right from the beginning, the stories in the Bhagavatam are also chosen from that perspective. Because the main character in the Bhagavatam has had a terrible thing happen to him. Parikshit Maharaj, for a small mistake, is cursed to die in seven days. It's a capital punishment, it's a very serious punishment. And he was sentenced something like that. Just for a small infraction. And therefore, Shukadeva Goswami, when he's telling the stories, first he tells some philosophy, but overall the main stories that define the Bhagavatam are stories of bad things happening to good people. Dhruva is just a simple boy, just living a normal life, wants to sit on his father's lap. And he's grievously insulted for that. Prahlad, he just wants, he's not harming anyone. He's worshipping Vishnu and what happens to him? His own father tries to kill him. In one sense, if you see the stories of the Bhagavatam, the intensity of the adversity that befalls the characters becomes worse and worse. So, at least with respect to Dhruva, it's an insult. But Prahlad, it's an assassination attempt itself. And it's one thing to want to, to, for someone to kill, but it's someone who, whom you expect to protect. That person turns a killer. That is shocking beyond words. If some terrorist comes and kills, say, some celebrity, some head of state, that is shocking. But if that that uh, VIP's bodyguard only kills them, that's even worse. So we see the atrocity, the adversity, it becomes worse and worse. And later on, we'll see in the 8th and 9th cantos as it on, on, moves onward. Now, if you see, this 8th canto is the story of Bali Maharaj. And 9th canto, we have the various stories in the 9th canto. But let's focus on this story right now. This is a recurring theme in the Bhagavatam. And we see, even in Krishna's own life, he is born and right before his birth itself, the whole plan is afoot to have him assassinated. And he has to dodge it all. So, we see this. Now, there can be different ways in which bad things happen to us. It's some things, we have done something small bad, but we get a big reaction to it. 
That's what happens to Parikshit Maharaj. Hmm. So, in general, our mind is such that it makes us feel that we alone are suffering. Or rather, no one else is suffering as much as we are suffering. I was in Canada and there's a devotee psychotherapist. He told me that for many years he has been doing, um, doing psychotherapy. But recently he started a group psychotherapy. So I said, who will want to open their hearts before a group? You know, to open your darkest secrets or darkest distresses before even one person is difficult. What to speak of in front of a group? So he said, we have, we have confidentiality codes. And that's how they open up. But uh, the advantage of that is, see, the mind gets us alone and then gets us. The mind gets us alone. Nobody is suffering like you are suffering. And then it goes into self-pity and it goes into self-destruction after that. So he said that when we have this, everybody opening up their problems, people start saying, yeah, actually, you know, distress is democratic. <laughs> distress is democratic. After one particular heart-churning session, which he had, he said, if all of you could put the worst problem of your life in front of you on this table, would any of you like to interchange your problem with anyone else's problem? No one raised their hand. <laughs> I'm saying in English, the devil you know is better than the devil you don't know. So, but still sometimes what happens is our mind tends to compare. We all can be happy. Mm -hmm. But we want to be happier than others. And that is impossible. So similarly, when we are distress, our mind makes us feel that nobody is suffering the way I am suffering. So what Shukadeva Goswami does is, tell stories of how people have suffered much more than what Parikshit has suffered. At least in the case of Parikshit, there is some fault. But in the case of Prahalad, you say, what is the fault? He's living virtuously. Okay, he's defying his father, but he's not really doing anything seriously wrong. He's actually simply worshipping the Lord. So, oh, now, so another story is this the story of Vamanadev. Now, this story is, is you could say unique, although not entirely unique, but it's it's extraordinary because it's when distress can come from various ways. When distress comes just by natural calamity. Okay, we still feel resentful, we still feel angry. Uh, say when a hurricane comes or something. But this is just the power of nature. It feels, we feel helpless. But when some person, some person who has an agenda to destroy us comes and causes distress. That's even more irritating, that's infuriating. But that's also a bad thing. Why is this person against me? What have I done to, what have I done to deserve this? We feel like that. But the worst situation is where God is causing the distress. We normally think of God as the deliverer from distress. And if God himself causes the distress to us, where do we go? In fact, this, this what Bali Maharaj demonstrates is actually demonstrated further in the 10th canto when the gopis leave everything for Krishna and then Krishna leaves them. First in the Ras Leela he leaves them and goes and then when he goes, leave, goes to Mathura he leaves and goes. So it is, if God is causing us suffering then where do we go? When the world causes suffering we go to God. If God causes suffering where do we go then? So what is by this kind of stories where far greater adversities have befallen others, Parikshit Maharaj is being held by Shukadeva Goswami to calm his mind down. Don't be resentful. Just accept and focus on the Lord. So now when God causes apparently distress, see God's purpose is never to cause us distress. His purpose is ultimately benevolent.
but sometimes that purpose is not immediately evident and that's the time when we need to persevere that's the time when our faith our character our determination are all tested so this is the background of the story when lord the lord comes as vamana and he tests bali maharaj so sometimes you may say if god is angry with us because we have done something wrong you that god has nothing personal against us but if we do something god and then we do something good and then god seems to be angry with us why what have i done so this is how the story is extraordinary and in this story let's look at the broad flow i'll talk about it today partially and tomorrow also i'll continue that so the bhagavatam describes a uh, time the universal history when everybody was broadly aligned with dharma at least in terms of understanding that there are higher powers in the universe and through yagya dana tapa those higher powers can be satisfied and when those higher powers are satisfied then we gain power so basically we see in this story that bali maharaj is a very powerful king and he is doing a yagya and at the time of yagya although yagya dana tapa are three distinct activities they are also simultaneously connected generally when a yagya is to be done at that time the yajman is expected to do some tapa maybe at least till the time yagya is over you fast so some kind of tapa is there and after yagya daan is to be given so give some charity so bali maharaj is doing this and there's a there's a yagya sacrifice going on and suddenly on the horizon he sees somebody coming who is so shiny that the sun seems to be dwarfed not in the glare but in the brightness so illumining the directions and then he sees this is a effulgent brahmana and he's attracted and the brahmana comes is actually is a brahmana but he's a small boy he is by his by his physical stature he is the height of a boy but he seems to be he seems to be having a wisdom beyond his age his effulgence is extraordinary and everybody in the assembly is charmed when they see this is brahmana boy he is a dwarf and he comes and then when bali maharaj sees him bali maharaj gets up and he offers him words of respect and worship he says my assembly is blessed that an illustrious brahmana like you has come here now and please let me know how can i serve you what can i do for you so at that time this brahmana speaks in a very sweet voice he says that the way you have welcomed me indeed befits your glorious dynasty generally the best charity is where the giver and the receiver both respect each other so it is not that the respect the giver demean the receiver you are so fallen i am doing a big favor to you but that attitude when charity is given the exchange the reciprocation is not very sweet at that time so first he he appreciates although he is going to be the giver he bali maharaj appreciates vamana and then vamana in response appreciates so generally for any interaction to be fulfilling there has to be a basic platform of mutual appreciation we may have our differences but if there is no basic respect then there can't be any relationship at all i was once at a conf- uh, at a mediation I was helping in a mediation and there are two people so one of them came said i know you are you are angry with me but the second person said no i am not angry with you 
anger is an expensive emotion you are not worth it <laughs> when somebody has that kind of attitude that it's very difficult to do any kind of resolution mm-hmm. you start by demeaning the other person and the other person is trying for reconciliation things will never work so in this case he says now we see that the bhagavatam offers a very beautiful principle that even the absolute truth doesn't always speak the absolute truth context is so critical for comprehending the content can any of you think of any incident any past time of krishna in which krishna doesn't speak the absolute truth uh, <coughs> killing of the elephant in the kurukshetra war i'm asking okay let's let's okay okay let's now let, let's let's stop let's not go into the mahabharat let's stick to the bhagavatam right now in the Mah- mahabharat is very confusing ethics but let's look in the Mm. where krishna speaks some philosophy other than the conclusive philosophy yeah govardhan lila yes yeah, good <laughs> govardhan lila good mm. so he speaks karma mimamsa and why does he do it he speaks it just to irritate indra just to infuriate indra that he say actually indra is not giving reins if you do your karma indra has bound to give you reins you don't have to please indra you just have to do your karma so it's like if somebody somebody speaks a lie we'll get angry why is person lying but if somebody as at the time i was talking i was trying to be between two devotees and one said say that one devotee said to the other person the other devotee if you want to lie at least respect my intelligence enough to tell a believable lie <laughs> <laughs> so if somebody speaks a lie that is also not believable then that means you think i am such a fool <laughs> so <laughs> what krishna does is even karma mimamsa is one of the six schools of vedic thought but it is not the conclusion and everyone knows it that way when krishna speaks karma mimamsa it is just to irritate indra So, so we have to look at the context even the absolute truth may not always speak the absolute truth because the absolute truth might also be pursuing some per- contextual purpose the similarly here when vamana starts speaking he says that you are very blessed and with a significant statement here he says you are very blessed because you have the great brahmana to guide you in this world who is that who is the brahmana guide the priest guiding shukracharya <coughs> says you have shukracharya guiding you in this world for for this world and you have your grandfather prahlad guiding you for the next world so significant two different guides and we will see that he this two different guides and two different choices which come the significance of them will come later but then he says how glorious prahal you while glorifying various people it's interesting bali ma bamana does not stress too much on prahlad over there he says hiranyaksh was so great that when he went around the universe everybody was in fear and when he was killed at that time hiranyakashipu got so angry that he went to vaikuntha in search of vishnu and vishnu became so terrified that he ran away from aikunt and then he thought where can i run he is hiranyakashipu this hiranyakashipu chased me everywhere so the only place where i am safe is inside his heart so he went inside in hid inside his heart and then hiranyakashipu searched everywhere even he found vishnu is about to be empty and then he concluded when he couldn't find him anywhere he said he has gone it seems vishnu has gone to the place from which no one returns that means he has died so now what is going on over here now this has never happened hiranyakashipu never goes to vaikuntha but the point is uh, here he is preparing bali maharaj for the request 
and he is he is in general whenever there is glorification hmm, the glorification when in general the, the mood in the indian tradition in the dharmic tradition is whenever there is glorification there is usually no reservation and when you glorify you glorify unreservedly and that's why sometimes if we don't understand the context it can appear confusing the the mahabharat has the vishnu sahasrana but the mahabharat also has the shiva sahasrana hmm? so when the context is the glory of lord shiva even lord shiva will be glorified so here the context is bali maharaj dynasty is being glorified and there is a lot of glorification so the point here is vamana is not here a teacher at this point at least he is not a teacher of shastra giving siddhanta so he is making a particular request is preparing the ground for a particular request so then after that then he glorifies <clears throat> bali maharaj's father virochan and then after that he comes to bali maharaj he says no one in your dynasty has ever refused charity and i am confident you also will not refuse charity and then he makes his request say normally if somebody starts praising us a lot our mind starts working you know if this person is speaking so nicely to me you know to ask me something after this what do you want and somebody is praising us a lot that means they are going to ask a lot from us <laughs> it's something like that so then after he glorifies him so much then he makes the request and he says i want three steps of land and significantly adds one condition i want to three steps of of land according to my steps ha <sighs> it's like uh, a request that is a anti climax is a request that is a anti climax oh, prabhupada would tell the story of uh, once the mountain were going to give birth and mountain was going to give birth a giant mountain so everybody wondered if the mountain is so big what will be born from the mountain so then everybody was waiting for the time the time and then a the time came from the mountain some tiny mice came out so prabhupada says sometimes like this today we have big big educational institutions but from them the products that are coming out you know, they have very little self mastery they have very, very little spiritual knowledge so it's an anti climax so anyway so on hearing this bali maharaj is taken aback and he says hey what's going on he says the words you have spoken are very wise but the request you made doesn't seem to be wise because you are still a child probably you don't understand the value of things anyone who comes to me and asks for charity they needn't have to go to ask for charity from anyone else after this therefore ask abundantly and then vamana replies that actually as a brahmana if i ask for more than what i need i lose my brahm my brahmanical dharma and i am satisfied with whatever with three steps if somebody is greedy they will never be satisfied no matter how much they have this theme of greed is also a big theme but i will not go into it today maybe tomorrow morning's bhagavatam class we can talk about satisfaction ambition and devotion something like that uh, but here so he says if somebody is not satisfied with what they have because their senses and mind are uncontrolled then they will never be satisfied this one point i'll make about this that see normally if we consider our situation so this is the thing things that we have and things we have and these are all the things we don't have often we think that to become happy we need to get the things that we don't have if we can move more things from the category of what i don't have to what i have then i will become happy or at least i'll become happier than what i am right now so now at one level it is true especially 
if the basic needs of life are not available. Many researchers have done a comparison of wealth and happiness. So if somebody is below the poverty line where the basic needs are not met, then happiness is proportional to wealth. If I don't have enough money to buy a meal and then I get enough money to buy a meal, immediately I get relief, I get happiness. So up to the point where the basic needs are met, there's a direct proportion between wealth and happiness. But beyond that, it becomes very unpredictable. It's erratic. After that, happiness depends not on how on how much on uh, <coughs> <coughs> happiness depends not on how much money we are making but on what we are making with our money what is the what are the values with which we are living if somebody is very very super competitive they want to get to the top in any profession they work extremely hard they get to the top but they have no time for their family they have no time for friends they're suspicious of everyone and they may have a huge house but then the huge house only offers them the privilege of a lot of space in which to feel lonely <laughs> so uh, what making money is important but what we are making with money is even more important so the point here is that we all think that there are things which I don't have and if I get them I'll become happy it is true up to a particular extent but when he says that uncontrolled mind and senses, what it means is that if our mind is uncontrolled, it will always look at the things we don't have. And no matter how many things we bring into the category of what we don't have, still there will be things which are in the category of what we don't have. And we will keep looking at that. We'll keep looking at that and we'll never be satisfied. So he, it's, he talks about contentment satisfaction comes by controlling the mind so that the mind looks at what one has and is satisfied in that if the mind is uncontrolled it will look at the things we don't have and it will stay dissatisfied always so, so when he speaks like this Bali Maharaj accepts okay if, if you know what you are doing then go ahead ask for three steps and at this point when he's about to uh, sanctif with sanctified water make a solemn promise something unexpected happens Shukracharya comes over there and he says stop, stop stop he said don't don't honor this request don't make this promise and Shukracharya says this is not just an ordinary Brahmana this is Vishnu and he has sided with your enemies, the gods. The previous chapters have described how Bali Maharaj, by performing the yajna, which with the Vishwajita yajna, which um, Shukracharya asks him to do, he gets enough power by which he conquers the universe. Which the Vishwajita to conquer the universe, that is the yajna which he has done, told him to do and it has been successful. So he has been able to defeat the Devtas. He has been ruling even the heavens. And the, the point of this background is that Shukracharya's advice has worked. Worked big time for him. Not only that much, it's even more than that. That actually Bali Maharaj had been killed earlier in a war but Shukracharya revived him he restored his life and now has given him unparalleled universal prosperity and at that time for him he will take any advice seriously now say you know if somebody invests in stocks and you have some dealer or some advisor you know you have invested some he said invest over here and his stock has multiplied enormously and if that person says don't invest over here 
You will take that invest advice very seriously. I don't want to invest over here. So he's a Brahmana, and he is telling, don't give charity, because it's Vishnu, and he actually gives a full description. He says he is asking for three steps, but know that he has said it's my three steps, and he will expand his steps, and with two steps only he will cover up the earth and the remaining planets, and thus he will. Declare that there is no space for the third step, and he will declare that you have failed to honor your promise, and this way you will be dishonored. So therefore, do not, do not listen to him. Do not give him charity, and then he goes on further for justifying also. Even if you feel you have said you will give charity, but in emergency situations, one. Should not honor one's words, and he gives various cases where there is apad dharma, emergency duty. Now there is dharma, which is normal duty. There is apad dharma, which is emergency duty. Now the problem is that different people define emergency differently. <laughs> so I might say this is apatti for me, and I won't do this. But whether that is really apad or not, that has to be carefully evaluated. So we'll see that. The definition of apad is different. So he says that do not honor this request. And at that point, Mali Maharaj thinks deeply. What should I do? Now for him, it's he he has one Brahmana who is visiting him, and he's promised some charity to him. There's another Brahmana who has been with him for a long time. And a Brahmana has actually done a lot of good to him. So there's saying that a bird in the hand is worth how many? Two in the bush. That means something which you have secure. It's better than something which is tentative. Maybe you'll get it. Maybe you won't, you won't get it. So for him, Shukracharya is a is a you could say a, a Brahmana with a proven track record. <laughs> <laughs> and Vam Vamana looks attractive, he is so endearing. He is spoken very sweetly, but still he is an untested commodity. So he has to choose. Now at this point, by every you could say by every reasonable reasoning, it is is be he I said he should listen to Shukracharya. Listen to Shukracharya and say, "Okay, I will not, I will not give this charity." But he doesn't, and he doesn't, and he gives a particular reasoning for that. And his reasoning is also very revealing. Why he says that I will not give. He main reason he says is. I have given my word. I am an honorable person, and as an honorable person, dishonor. He says to dishonor my word is worse than that. It's a, actually some people take their words very seriously. If they promise something, they will do it. Some people take only words seriously. <laughs> that means they seriously speak words and they don't do anything after that. <laughs> they speak very earnestly, but when it comes to doing, I say, when did I say that? Uh, did I say that it's some people seem to have uh, the the ability to selectively delete their memory. <laughs> mm, so it's, sometimes they're just making it up, and sometimes they genuinely forget it. It's it's different people's minds work differently. Some people they are more concerned about assuring people than helping people. When somebody they say is in trouble, they'll assure that person, oh everything will be alright, I'll help you. So at that then they're not ill intention. But what happens is their concern is oh you're in distress. I don't want you to be in distress. They'll assure. But when it comes time of actually helping, 
they forget it. So it's not that they are ill intention. It's just the way their psychology works is they will over promise, and then when it comes the time of delivering, they become MIA, missing in action. They just disappear completely. So <laughs> like the politicians, <laughs> yes, they are active in action before the elections, and. What is it? They said the politician shakes your hand before the elections and shakes your faith after the elections. <laughs> mm. So anyway, at this point, he says, I am an honorable person. And as an honorable person, there are, he gives multiple reasons. He says there are great souls who have even given up their lives for the sake of truth. He says, for me, if I can give up my life for serving a Brahmana, why should I not do that? It's interesting. He's saying I'm serving a Brahmana, but he's not thinking of serving Shukracharya as a Brahmana. So then he says further that if what you say is true that this is Vishnu, then I am confident that just as I care for my honor, Vishnu also cares for his honor. And Vishnu will not kill me. Vishnu, if it is really Vishnu, if he is so scared of me, that he has come in the garb of Brahmana to ask charity from me, then giving charity to him will enhance my honor. If he is Vishnu, and if he is going to remove this garb and fight against me, then I am sure he will fight honorably. And either he will be killed by me, or I will be killed by him. But either way, I will give charity. So at this point, there is nothing directly devotional in the approach of Bali Maharaj. What is there is? It's, it's honor. I will act honorably. Now, honor is also, to act honorably is very good. But he's talking about honor, reputation, dynasty. He's not thinking that, oh, Vishnu is everything and I meant to offer everything to Vishnu. This is not the thought at this, uh, for him at this time. There is, a, there is a particular time when there's a dramatic turn that happens in the lives of certain characters. And at this point, when he gives the charity, at that time, we'll see how Vishnu expands. But here, I would like to stop at this point, and we'll continue tomorrow. We can have some questions. But what happened here, this point, the, the point I was making here is that the, I started by talking about what do good people do when bad things happen to them. So now through this discussion, what is being built up is how Bali Maharaj is such a good person. He's such a good person that even when his own guru tells him to do a bad thing, he says no. He says no. So for such a, he is such a good person, he does such a good thing, and then such a bad thing happens to him, because of whom? Because of God, who is supposed to be all good. So what kind of outrage is this? What kind of atrocity is this? So at that point, how he responds and why he responds that way. That is, that is very special. So there is a time in these great characters' life, like Rutrasu's life also, I'll talk to Marhav, at a particular time, suddenly it changes. He's acting like a Rakshasa up to a particular point and suddenly starts acting like a devotee. Here also, he's acting like an honorable Kshatriya, but suddenly it will change. But the change requires a great challenge. Usually, you know, we don't change till the till the price of changing becomes less than the cost of staying where we are. <laughs> the price of changing becomes less or the cost of staying where we are becomes so much that we have to change. So sometimes Krishna does that where we are living, he just increases the cost over there. And then we are forced to change. So when apparently a bad thing is happening to a good person, it is not 
so that the good people that god is dissatisfied with their being good and that they should become bad now why should they? actually god is happy with their being good but he wants to, them to rise from goodness to excellence goodness to transcendence and how various characters rise from goodness to transcendence when bad things happen to them that is the overarching theme of the bhagavatam so to summarize today's class i spoke on this theme of uh, what do good people do when bad things happen to them that is the overarching story of the uh, the mood of the bhagavatam which is going to help parikshit maharaj to cope with the terrible thing that has happened to him for a small infraction a death sentence and we see that dhruv maharaj is insulted like that prahlad is insulted prahlad is as attempted to be assassinated like that but there are bad people doing bad things that's understandable good people doing bad things is is a little more difficult to understand but god apparently doing a bad thing is almost unacceptable so that's what happens to bali maharaj and that's what happens to the gopis and through it all how the great characters react how they how do they respond that's what is described so in this story i talked about how bali maharaj is doing yagya and at that time he is giving dana and vamana vamana comes over there and vamana wins by his effulgence and then he speaks counterfactually the absolute truth doesn't always speak the absolute truth because context is important and then he gives a discourse on contentment by saying that for happiness how much our possessions are is not important how much things we can move from what we don't have to what i have is not important how much my mind is controlled so that i can learn to look at what i have that is important and then after that bali maharaj says okay first thing is a child who doesn't know the value of things but now if you know what you're doing ask what you want ask what i'll give you three steps of land as per your steps and then shukracharya stops he's vishnu he's going to steal everything is come on the behalf of your enemies and bali maharaj for bali maharaj this is a brahmana who has saved his life and has given him uh, the heavens and this is an unknown brahmana but still because he wants to honor, be truthful he says i will give charity so he goes against reason to do good there is no transcendence in his reasoning but he wants to be virtuous in terms of being a honorable person and when he is ready to pay such a price for being good instead of being rewarded he will apparently be punished and how he responds to that and why vamana does that we'll talk in tomorrow's class thank you very much are there any questions or comments how do you have a question yes you yeah, are very nice class bro some some very simple things that we can very nicely understand my question is this one problem i have two questions one is what you said is is absolute is not always absolute so what happens is when it is you know scripted or when it is documented and if we read you know how if we take out of context yeah it's there is a lot of negative implication yes so okay so the absolute truth doesn't speak the absolute truth then it is always possible that people may take it out of context and then it can cause a lot of damage yes that's why um Uh, it's important that we learn how to learn scripture we don't just learn scripture but we learn how to learn scripture that means that <coughs> scripture was traditionally studied um, under a guru and the guru the idea of a guru is that the guru has assimilated assimilated the essence of scripture and then we learn it from them and then we have opportunity to clarify to get better understandings and one of the it's very important that the context be seen so often we quote certain verses from scripture and it's good to quote verses but sometimes the verses come in a particular context and if you don't understand that context then we can end up with getting some different meaning or some opposite meaning also 
and in fact there is in philosophy of language it's a big subject that where do the meanings of words reside hmm? do they reside in the dictionary hmm. you could say they reside in the dictionary but in english is i think that the word run has something like several hundred meanings hmm? it's like run means uh i am going to run in the marathon i am going to run in an election they do different kinds of running the machine has stopped running that's another kind of running isn't it so you can have uh run the word run has so many meanings and somebody only looks at the dictionary then he will not understand which meaning to apply so that's why if uh, that's why actually if somebody only reads the dictionary to understand meanings you know if somebody wants to improve their vocabulary he say don't just memorize the words see how the words are used in, memorize the meanings of the words see how they are used in sentences because only then we come to know okay this word means this sometimes you may look at this word and this word are synonymous but certain words may have certain connotations which may not be seen just when the just by the uh, dictionary meaning so it it happens so many times that if you just take one word in a different context i was in london and i gave a class as a youth meeting and after a lot of question answers and the question answers went quite well by krishna's mercy and then the organizer came to me with a, the the devotee of the organizer came to me with a bright smile he says you killed it what did i kill <laughs> i i thought it was just some insect i sat on it or what and then why if i killed it why are you smiling <laughs> like this <laughs> so it is he was using it in non, non literal sense it's a non literal meaning derived from a hunting metaphor like say somebody goes for hunting and somebody shoots you kill it that is your spot on you are in target you perform very well so If you killed it, if I take it the literal meaning, I'll I'll be alarmed. So similarly, this literal and metaphor, literal and non-literal meanings is one way, but context is extremely important to understand things. And scripture is spoken. The uh, scripture is giving eternal truths, but eternal truths are spoken in a particular context. So we have to look at the context. If you like, if you look at the context, the Bhagavad Gita's spirituality, the Bhagavad Gita's bhakti. is very wo- world affirming arjuna wants to renounce the world and krishna says fight in the world the bhagavatam spirituality bhagavatam's bhakti is very world renouncing why because context is different mm-hmm. in the bhagavad gita's Bha- bhagavad gita's analysis the way krishna analyzes it it is like either you do you do bhakti yoga if you can't do bhakti yoga you do karma yoga but there is practically no verse in the bhagavad gita in which krishna recommends gyan yoga this gyan yoga is there but he is not recommending gyan yoga hmm? whereas in the uddhav gita actually krishna recommends bhakti yoga and he says if you bhakti yoga you can't do then do gyan yoga why because the stress over there is renounce the world krishna himself is departing from the world parikshit maharaj decided to leave the world so the same essential principle for arjuna at that time before the kurukshetra war it was important for him to act in the world to establish dharma so if we look at the context they are different and that's why all the bhakti principles are the same but the emphasis is different in the bhagavad gita you do not see any description of bhakti as ecstatic now we don't hear even krishna telling any words that you know the devotee goes mad in ecstasy and dances in kirtans <laughs> There's no verse like that in the Bhagavad Gita. Why? It is there in the Bhagavatam in the uh, some sections of the Bhagavad Gita and Chaitanya Charitamrita is filled with that. Because the point is, in Arjuna's context, his emotions were coming in the way of dharma, and that's why the whole stress of the Bhagavad Gita is like an unem- uh, unemotional, internalized, intellectualized kind of spirituality. 
not intellectualized in the sense of only for brahmanas but it's more of an analytical kind of spirituality where your focus is on duty determination to duty not on emotional effervescence so if you look at the teaching of bhakti itself its stress is different in different books and what to speak of other teachings so we don't need to look at context to understand things okay thank, thank you thank you very much krishna prabhu ji in this uh, incident bali maharaj does not accept the advice of sacharya and he is glorified and in the other in contrast if you see prayadu accepted the instructions of hiranyakashipu to give poison to her own son and there is nothing said anything against payadu on in that matter so how do we understand that mm -hmm. okay mm -hmm. bali maharaj is glorified because he is so thoughtful enough that he rejects the instruction of his guru and he is glorified for that but kayadu she she gives poison on her and she was instructions to prahlad where is this said bhagavatam doesn't say that that kayadu gives the poison did you hear this somewhere specifically so oh, that is what is it not there in bhagavatam he gives at least i don't remember it you know that he was given poison but mostly describe the rakshasas rakshas try to they burn him they try to pierce him with weapons the bhagavatam does not describe all the tortures very elaborately maybe it is in the other puranas but let's uh, assume for uh, for the sake that it is true it's a uh, this answer um, see in the role of women or the role the role of genders in society that is very differently in different times and in the past mm, where men were primarily in leadership positions mm, women were leaders of homes of course that's enough man i'll take after months okay you can, you can keep this only keep pouring mm, i don't need anything more thank you so generally the leaders are responsible for their actions and when prabhupad sometimes makes certain statements about women some, which some people find very objectionable but as a prabhupad compare say women are like children so we see that in the scripture generally even if a woman does something seriously wrong she is not punished jitake tumharaj past time the queens they poison a baby but they are not punished there is no description of they being punished for that mm. or for that matter when kai kai uh, gets misled by mantara and she becomes the cause of her husband's death and she becomes the cause of ram's exile there is no description that either kai kai or mantara were punished at that so in so the idea is that um, in that traditional cultural setting because women were treated like children this is not to demean women but different times see uh, if people lived with different values at different times and today the whole idea is there is a ultra feminist uh, narrative which says as if throughout history men have been exploiting women and now women are gaining their rights and we are going to fight for our rights now actually this is a very distorted understanding of history you know throughout history there have been a few powerful men who have exploited women and exploited men hmm? there are some people who become autocratic and if you see who even if we say there was domestic violence or whatever now who fought in the wars primarily it was men it was men who were killed so the the point here is not to 
uh, going to analysis of the role of women in society, Vedic society, international society or whatever. But the point is that life is tough. And throughout history, you know, men and women have, have cooperated in the best way possible to, to face the challenges of life. And so in the traditional society, women are generally expected to be guided by the men. And if a woman does something wrong, it is like a child doing something wrong. The child is not punished for that. It is the parents who are considered responsible for that. And so similarly, in general, if a woman does something wrong, it's not she is not considered culpable, at least in a very serious sense. Hmm? So assuming that if Kayadu did that, and it's possible because if Hiranyakashipu had told her, she might have done it. Assuming that she did that, still she would not be considered culpable because it was Hiranyakashipu's responsibility to have guided her properly and not misguided her. She would have died, uh, like, if Buddha would have, would, have, would have been a threat from Hiranakashipu, she would have would not poison my son, and if you want, you can kill me, but I will not poison <coughs> It's tough. It's tough in the sense that uh, for a wife to choose between her husband and her son in a traditional society is not easy. And in fact, it's, it's like Ram also, you know, I talk about contextual morality. Uh, when Ram is with Kaikai, sorry not Kaikai, with Kaushalya, Kaushalya says, I will go with you to the forest. And then he says, I, he says no. He says, your um, a wife's duty is with her husband. And he says that, actually first she says, she's a little, she's very unhappy with what has happened, not just unhappy, outraged. Shocked, horrified, devastated. So then he says, she may not want to do any duty to her husband who is exiling her son away. She says, actually, she at this point, you know, the king has been grievously betrayed by his wife who was so dear to him. If at that time you also reject him, it will be unbearable for him. So he, Ram expertly shifts the vision so that he doesn't see that Dashrath is the victimizer and you are the victim. He says, he needs you right now. And then he, he agrees. But that same Ram, when he comes back to Sita, he tells Sita, no, stay at home and take care of my parents. I will go to the forest. So he doesn't tell her, a wife's duty is to be with her husband. <laughs> <laughs> so the point over there is that he at one level doesn't want Sita to go through all the discomfort. And he also wants to make sure that Sita really wants to come with him. Eventually, when Sita force insists that I will come, he says, I'll be very happy to have you with me. So, um, in general, especially in a traditional society, for a woman to choose between, for a, between her son and her husband, it's not an easy choice. So, I think uh, we may feel that that's absolutely wrong. How can you do that? But in that cultural context, it's, it's quite difficult. It's a difficult choice. Thank you. Possibility that she also had a trust because she had heard the philosophy from Narada during her pregnancy. So she is trusting the Lord and surrendering to his will. <coughs> yeah, that's possible. Mm. Mm. Is, could be the yeah, Kayadu be surrendering to the Lord's will and being a part of a Leela or the Leela. Yes, it could be. Mm. So generally, characters in scripture and their actions can be understood in multiple ways. And to, we can always say that all the characters in the Lord's pastimes are, are participating in his Leela and are orchestrated accordingly. Uh, and that is a, one way of understanding things. Uh, the limitation with that way of looking at things is that there is nothing for us to learn from it. Everybody just are doing God's will. Then, which, which action is right? Which action is wrong? Should we act like this? Should we not act like this? There is nothing to learn in that. So, we see Prabhupada takes both approaches. For example, if you read the first chapter and the second chapter purports of the Bhagavad Gita, Prabhupada's 
uh, way of talking about Arjuna shifts drastically. In the first chapter, Prabhupada is glorifying Arjuna. Even on the in, in the heat of a battle, he is not just impulsively doing things. He is thinking deeply. He is asking serious questions. And in the next chapter, suddenly, he says he is attached to his body. He is having the ignorance of the bodily conception. Everybody has skin disease. Lamentation is because of ignorance. Don't save the dress of a drowning person. Prabhupada's tax changes completely. So what is going on there? There is a commentator on the Bhagavad Gita Madhusudan Saraswati. He explains that the first chapter's purpose is to demonstrate the patrata of Arjuna. That how Arjuna is qualified to acquire spiritual knowledge. What is his qualification? That he is thoughtful. He is contemplative. He is seriously thinking before acting. That is his qualification. But then, from the second chapter onwards, yes, he is qualified to have knowledge, but he doesn't have knowledge right now. So, that is stressed. Okay, he's, he's, So, from that context, is ignorance stressed. stressed. So, it, um, so, you could say that it's all Krishna's will. He's acting according to Krishna's will that he goes into illusion. But then if you want to understand analytically, then the looking at it from other perspectives is also helpful. Okay, thank you. Any other questions or comments? Yes. Hmm. Yeah, you mentioned that to me in the afternoon. I'll, I'll. The Bhagavatam is full of histories like that. So, how to okay. understand this? So, the Bhagavatam is filled with uh, unbelievable sounding say, sizes, sizes of people, sizes of universal objects, planets, and everything. Actions of people can also seem sometimes unbelievable. So how do we understand this? Firstly, the Bhagavatam is a kavya. It's a poetic work. And it has a particular artha. It has a per artha can mean meaning, artha can also mean purpose. Hmm? So <coughs> like the four purusha arthas are there, the four purposes of living, the panchama purusha artha, parma artha is there, the supreme meaning. So artha means purpose also. The purpose of the Bhagavatam is to help Parikshit Maharaj fix his mind on Krishna. And <clears throat> we see the various stories in the Bhagavatam are meant to meant to take us toward that purpose. To help. Uh, in, in those stories also we see different characters are fixing their mind on the Lord. So we need to make sure that that is the primary purpose that we focus on when we study the Bhagavatam. That we are able to fix our mind on the Lord. That is the primary purpose of the Bhagavatam. Now, whatever extraordinary details are told in the Bhagavatam, if you consider the fifth canto cosmology for example, Mm. There are, I was a part of the cosmology team which is helping in making the planetarium at one time. So, if you consider 15 to 25 chapters in the Bhagavatam, that is where the cosmology is described. But within that also, the number of verses that actually describe cosmic dimensions are very few. The main thing over there is, okay, in the, there is this loka over here and in that loka, the people are glorifying this form of the Lord. And in that particular planet, they are glorifying the form of the Lord over there. They are glorifying the form of the Lord over there. But the stress is not on describing the universe. The stress is on uh, describing what is done throughout the universe. They are two different things. Hmm? So, the emphasis is how everyone is glorifying the Lord everywhere. That's the stress. And this is the stress uh, even if you look at the start and the end of the bhag of the sections, it is by meditating on this, 
um, by understanding the cosmology of the universe, one will be able to fix the mind on the Lord better. By understanding how grand it is, by understanding how everyone in throughout the universe is worshipping the Lord, we will be able to become more fixed in worshipping the Lord, in fixing our mind on the Lord. So that is the central purpose. So now today, it could be that uh, many scientists, at least the initial scientists, the founders of modern science, all of them were theists. And understanding the universe often deepened their appreciation of God. Uh, it is Pascal who said that uh, a little of science takes man away from God, but immersion in science brings man back to God. So, it could be that today's scientific cosmology can also help some people to fix their mind on God. So now, if somebody has grown up with today's scientific cosmology and the Bhagavatam's cosmology seems very different and does the person has to completely reject the scientific cosmology and completely accept the Bhagavatam cosmology to fix the mind on the Lord? Not necessarily. It is the point is fix the mind on the Lord. It is, see, ultimately the cosmology is, uh, it's, it's a model. A model is like a map. There is some connection of the map with the reality, with the territory. But it's not, the map is not the territory. Mm. Uh, okay, to take this example further. Mm. See, so sometimes there are different GPS apps. Somebody might have this standard Google app, Google Maps, somebody might have Waze, somebody might have something else. Now suppose these maps, they map the territory in different ways. Like somebody uses a political map, somebody uses a, uh, somebody uses a maybe topographical map or something like that. Now the maps may be different. Now the important thing is, if the map I am following is taking me to the destination. Now if somebody can sit and try to compare both the maps and see, how do they do match? That's fine. If somebody wants to do it, they can do it. But the important thing is not that the two maps match, but that the map takes us to the destination. So the so in our own tradition, it's implicitly accepted that there are different maps. See, our own acharyas, when they have talked about, say, the um, horoscope of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu or the horoscope of Krishna or the horoscope of the great saints in our tradition, None of them has used the Bhagavatam's cosmology to do astrology. There is for there are two visions of the two models of the cosmos in our tradition itself. There's a Bhagavatam cosmology and there's a Jyotisha cosmology. So like Bhakti Sanskrit Thakur has studied Surya Siddhanta. Surya Siddhanta is a Jyotisha Shastra. And everybody uses this Siddhanta texts for studying the Bhagavatam, for, for studying astrology. And even our Acharyas who have commented on the Bhagavatam, while referring to cosmology, have referred to, while referring to astrology, have referred to the Siddhanta texts. So, one meaning of Achintya Bheda Bhed, it can have many different meanings, is that we are not uncomfortable with contradiction. Our philosophy is not that anything and everything is acceptable, but that we are comfortable with contradiction. So yes, there are two different models of the universe and somebody who is very into the models can study and see what parts can be harmonized. Some devotees, Sadaput Prabhu was a prominent disciple of Srila Prabhupada, scientist. He wrote a book on Vedic Cosmography and then he wrote another book on... Um, he wrote an... Uh, <clears throat> what was the second book? Does anyone remember? Yeah, uh, for Not Forbidden Archaeology. And so no, that's a recent book, that's by another devotee. Sir. Anyway, he wrote two books mm. by, uh, by Dr. Richard L. Thompson, in which he has explained it, he has tried to mm. do a, bring a, do a two into two co cosmological worldviews into a dialogue. So that can be done. But the important thing is not to prove that they are literally right. That has not been the passion of our Acharyas also. The emphasis is that this is used to meditate on the Lord. 
So now, if that meditational tool doesn't help us to meditate but causes us to agitate, how is this true? How is this true? Then anukulya sa sankalpa pratikulya sa parjana. That we accept what is favorable. And even in the Bhagavatam commentaries of the fifth canto, Prabhupada is not stressing on the literal dimensions. He is giving principles of spiritual life. So we focus on those principles and we move on. And similarly, mystic powers, if we consider, are extraordinary dimensions. Now, <clears throat> even in today's world, I gave a class on mystic powers. I said that the mystic powers are different from ordinary powers in degree, not in category. That means, that is some sages could know what happens in another part of the world. How do they know that? It's not possible to know. But science has found out to some extent that there are certain abilities which certain people have more than others. And people don't know how they have it. You see, there is an experiment called the staring experiment. Staring experiment means that, say, say I'm sitting here and somebody sitting behind me and that person stares at me. And then they are either staring at me or they are not staring at me. And I have to guess. Are they staring at me or are they not staring at me? So almost everybody gets this right 60%. More than, if it's, if it's simply probability, it will be 50%. Almost everybody gets it right more than 60% or whatever. And most of us have that ex feeling. You know, we feel somebody staring at us and we look back and that person gets embarrassed and looks away or something like that. Hmm? So, now, some people get this right 90%. Now, how do they get it right? Now, there are no eyes in the back of the brain. And you might say, oh, some waves come from somewhere and they give some. But what, what, what is it? In terms of reductionistic science, there is no explanation. So, there is, there is much in the body of scientific knowledge where there is data, but there is no explanation for the data. So that means there are observations, but there are no theories to explain the observations. So uh, the scientific worldview is very powerful in what it explains, but it doesn't explain everything. Mm -hmm. And there could be more inclusive worldviews which could explain things which the current scientific worldview doesn't explain. So apparent mystical powers they are just uh, radical extensions of the powers which people have. Mm -hmm. So that is something which is intelligible. And cosmic dimensions, the universe is very big. We really don't know what happens in other parts of the universe. Now, in fact, Carl Sagan, when he made his document in the cosmos, he's quite, he was Carl Sagan was a, was a atheist. He starts his cosmos it's a, it's a celebrated documentary series, but it starts with an article of faith. And what is the article of faith? The cosmos is all that was, the cosmos is all that is, the cosmos is all that will be. Now this is not a scientific statement. This is an ideological statement. Because science can study what is. Science can study material nature. Whether something exists beyond material nature, science can't know that. Because science only makes material observations. So, some, so, so sometimes, scienti sometimes some scientists misuse the authority of science to propagate their ideology. Hmm? So science intrinsically will give us certain explanations of certain things and certain things are not explainable in science. So we don't have to necessarily put scripture and science in competition. No, they are actually scripture. If you put scripture and science in competition, we devalue scripture. Because scripture is given much higher knowledge. So the way, this, this can be a big subject, but I'll quickly summarize with one last point. That science is the study of matter. Scripture is the study of what matters. <laughs> study of matter, Okay, how, how functions work, how, how this works, how this works, how this works. But study of what matters. What is important in life? What am I meant to do? Einstein said the same thing in a different way. He said, we can talk about the ethical foundations of science. 
but we can't talk about the scientific foundation of ethics. Hmm? <laughs> we can, that means we can ask whether scientists are acting ethically or not. But ethics, now what is right, what is wrong? Science doesn't tell us that. Science is not, not moral, science is not immoral, science is amoral. Science will, amoral means morality is not involvement. Science will tell you if you press the trigger of this gun, the person over there will be shot. But should you press the trigger or not, science doesn't tell you that. There is something which you have to decide. And again, this is not to minimize science. This is to contextualize science. Every body of knowledge has its own purpose. And that purpose, it will serve well. But when we extend it beyond its purpose, that's when the problem comes up. Okay? Thank you. So I think we will stop here. Thank you very much. Kantra Srimad Bhagavatam ki. Shri Vamana Dev ki. Srila Prabhupada ki. Gaur Bhakta Vrinda ki. Tai Gaur Premanandi.